Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Lloyd Liu. I'm a co-founder of uh, Kyber Network. And I'm excited to be here today to share our thoughts on uh, you know, scaling public blockchain and uh, we'll make a case for application-specific solutions. Um, so the goal of this talk is not to propose uh, you know, uh, a detailed solution for scaling public blockchain, but rather we want to propose a new perspective or a new view uh, when, uh, when it comes to scaling public blockchain. Um, so before I go into the details, uh, this is a brief background of myself and Kyber Network. Um, before I started Kyber, I, uh, together with my team, we designed Elastico, uh, the first peer review sharding protocol for public blockchain. And it got published in uh, CCS 2016, which is uh, one of the best computer security conference in academia. And Elastico heavily inspired Silica, one of the leading uh, scalable blockchain in the space. I also created Oriente, the first uh, open source smart contract verifier, uh, which is popularly used by uh, companies like Quantstam, Melonpod, and Augur. Um, so uh, together with our co-founders, we uh, created Kyber Network, which is a, uh, you know, an on-chain liquidity protocol uh, to facilitate decentralized token swap. So let me just um, you know, quickly walk, through, uh, uh, walk you through like, what Kyber enables. Uh, the first thing is we, uh, we enable decentralized uh, on-chain token swap. So the idea here is you can easily convert from one token to a different one uh, fully on the blockchain and running on the smart contract. Um, so this feature has been integrated with major wallets like Myter Wallet, uh, IAM Token, the most pop uh, popular wallet in China. Uh, Coinbase Wallet and Trust Wallet as well. Um, so we are pushing. We are also pushing for to you know ex ex extend the uh, protocol to support uh, decentralized payments. So the idea here is that users they can pay from any ERC20 tokens, and the recipient or the merchants they can receive in the other token of their choice uh, and instantly within one single transaction. Um, we have integrated with Ethereum on. Keep it so that their users uh, can have better option when it comes to payment from uh, you know cryptocurrency and tokens. Um, and we are actively working uh, with other decentralized financial apps and protocols like Melonpod, uh, Set Protocol, uh, B0X, and and a few other decentralized funds so that they can get access to uh, the liquidity on Kyber. So Kyber has been live uh, for more than six months on Ethereum. Uh, so we have been processing thousands of transactions per day, and we receive a lot of feedbacks from the users. Uh, at the same time, we have integrated with more than 30 different uh, projects in the space as well. Uh, so we have some certain idea or expectation when it comes to you know, scalability for public blockchains. Um, the major feedback that we receive from our users is that uh, you know, the fees on Ethereum are unpredictable, and sometimes you know, they, they, they have to pay a lot more, and sometimes they don't have like, to pay as much. Um, and uh, another issue is that the long confirmation on the blockchain, um, you know, in the, in the good condition, you may have to wait for from 15 to 20 uh, seconds uh, so that you, you can be sure that your transaction is in, right? But, you know, when crypto kitty happens, you may have to wait for like hours. Um, and um, working closely with other projects in the space, um, also give us some idea about scalability, um, and we want to achieve scalability uh, without paying uh, you know, more costs on the cross-platform integrations. Because we have been uh, integrating with uh, several major uh, protocols and, and platforms on the smart contract, so if it makes you know, uh, much harder for us to integrate, then it defeats the point, right? Um, and that's why the transition per second metric uh, to Kyber is not everything. Because what we, what, we, what we see is that the metric of transition per second is too broad. It doesn't capture other necessary uh, properties of a scalable and practical blockchain. Uh, instead, we need to have a scalable blockchain that, so, uh, that, that can also provide an or, gu or guarantee low transition fees, uh, low latency as well. And it, and you know, it has to uh, allow ease of you know execution of complex transaction. The transaction that may involve you know different platforms, different smart contract, and you can do a lot more there. Uh, this is these are the three main properties that we consider to be much more important 
for enabling uh, real-world adoption and real-world use cases for public blockchains. Now, uh, let's review all the existing uh, scalability approaches uh, that people are talking today. Um, so there's one line of work that focus on scaling the uh, you know, consensus mechanism uh, that is underlying for the blockchain. And here, here I use um, you know, several uh, POS-based blockchain. Um, the first one is uh, VRF, or uh, Verifiable Random Function-Based Proof of Stake, like Algorand or Definity. So they propose a new mechanism to uh, randomly select the, the leaders in a faster mechanism. Um, and another one is uh, DPoS or Liquid POS. They make a you know, certain decentralization trade-off uh, to uh, scale up the blockchain. For example, with EOS, they, can, um, they only allow 21 uh, um, you know, people or nodes to propose a block. Um, the main limitation of you know, all this layer one scaling is that it's not the ultimate solution. Uh, because you know, if you, you think about it, the more the blockchain grows, um, the more data that people have to process. And, uh, and eventually, not many people will be able to afford to run full nodes. And the blockchain will become pretty centralized in a sense. And that defeats the purpose. Um, and if you have like, you know, try uh, you know, uh, running a full node uh, on Ethereum from scratch, you will see the, 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 the difficulty. And with EOS, with Tezos, and a, and a few other blockchains, there's uh, you know, much more data that full nodes have to process. And at the end of the, uh, and, ev and eventually, uh, not many people will be able to set up their full node there. And um, people will have like, to resort to sharding or other layer two uh, solutions to improve. Now, let's talk about sharding. Now, sharding is promising because uh, it offers, it allows scalability without e uh, increasing the resources from nodes. The idea here is that you distribute the network into different smaller shards, and each of the shards manages its own chain that keeps a fraction of the state. So if you want to scale up, what you do is you just add more nodes, create more shards, right? Uh, instead of like, you know, uh, increasing the resources at, at the node. But the main limitation for sharding is that the cross-shard communication may kill all the scaling efficiencies. And why do we need to have cross-shard communication? Because the data is distributed in different places and there's no direct way for a smart contract in one shot to communicate and get the data on, the, on a different shot. And eventually, you may have to require uh, you know, many more transactions than what is done on one, on, uh, in one transaction today on Ethereum. So let me just give you a, a simple example. You want to book a hotel, and, you, and, and at the same time, you want to book the flight ticket. And you don't want to book one without the other. Uh, unfortunately, the hotel and the flight ticket smart contract are in two different shards. And you may have to do some you know, commit and release scheme in order to guarantee that you book one without the other. Uh, sorry, you do not book one without the other. And it may require at least three or four different transactions to finish the operation. Why, you know, with existing Ethereum, you can do everything in one single transaction. So it can solve all the you know, you know, efficiency gains uh, from sharding. Um, another promising um, approach is Plasma. So Plasma is nice because it allows you to move all the transaction to a sidechain. Um, and on this sidechain, there's a crypto economic mechanism to avoid cheating uh, and to allow the users to move back to the root chain or Ethereum chain if anything bad happens on on the Plasma chain. There are several challenges, um, including data availability. That means you know, you know, the validator work is supposed to be centralized to offer much better scalability. Uh, the, the, the validator can become malicious, and it can withhold the data from the users. And uh, when the validator is bad, uh, there may be mass exit, right? And just, just imagine that there are millions of users running on the Plasma chain and all of them need to get back to, to the root chain. It's not going to work, right? Because you know, Ethereum now will have to process millions of transactions um, because of this. 
And most of the existing solutions trying to address these challenges by making more assumption. So that's why we are seeing a line of work like you know, Plasma Cache, uh, Plasma HD, and a few others. Um, but that's not the main limitation of Plasma. So for Plasma, the most well-known way to scale up is to add more layers. And you know, Plasma is already a layer two solution. It's really hard for you to reason about like, security and data availability. Now, if you want to add more layers on top of that, it's going to be a nightmare for anyone to you know, guarantee anything. Um, and not only about security, but also interoperability as well. What happens if you know, you're running something on this Plasma chain and you want to like, get access uh, to information on a different chain? Um, so that's why Plasma is more suitable for standalone ecosystem. Like, you know, if you have your game, you can run on Plasma chain. You, if you have your, you know, social network, you can run it there, right? Instead of like pro, uh, creating a platform for everything. Um, so this is the another well-known solution, State Channel, um, which is inspired by Playment Channel, and. The idea of state channel is that you can do a lot more transaction off chain, and um, you know you can do a lot more payments, you know state update and things like that. But at the end of the day, you only need to do uh, only a handful of transaction to settle the state or the payment on the blockchain. Um, the main problem for state channel is that it's harder to generalize it, uh, especially for complex applications, because you know state encoding is hard and can become large. And sub submitting it to the blockchain may be even more expensive than the value at stake. So we are talking about micro, uh, uh, we are talking about micro payment channel, right? And if submitting the state to claim anything on the blockchain may cost you $10, then it's not micro anymore. Um, and there's you know, uh, other like availability assumption for all the parties involved. Um, and uh, it's well known that you know, state channel is more suitable for turn-based game or applications. So with all these, um, with all these uh, approaches, um, we realize that the key challenge to scale our general uh, purpose blockchain is that we cannot make any assumption on the applications that the blockchain support. So that's why we have to make the protocol as generic as possible to handle all the possible outcomes. Um, and if, if you have noticed, right, uh, most of the proposed scalability solutions are initially demonstrated uh, with you know, only a, some specific use cases, like you know, payment channel for state channel, and, and like you know, plasma cache for plasma. And later on, it's much harder to generalize the solution. Um, so the question that we really uh, raise in this talk or in this uh, at Kyber is that is it even feasible to build a general scalability solution, or should we even focus on looking for one? So in order to understand and you know answer these questions, let's revisit the scalability dilemma. So this is a well-known one. I guess everyone already uh, you know have seen it. Um, the idea here is like between, sca scalability, uh, sca between scalability, uh, decentralization, and security, you can pick at most two. Um, so this makes sense because it allows people to make some certain trade-off uh, to build a more scalable blockchain. Uh, for example, in EOS, uh, they make the trade-off in decentralization. Uh, they, can support, um, they, they can support much uh, better throughput because there, there are only like 21 nodes processing the generation. Um, in Plasma, there's some trade-off in security assumption. Uh, the, the users may have to monitor all the validators to prevent fraud and to you know, exit uh, you know, timely enough to, to the main chain, to the root chain. Um, so, at, so at Kyber, we think that this uh, you know, scalability dilemma uh, is a bit too broad. Um, is, is trying to create the framework for the blockchains that do everything. But you know, from several examples in the real world, we have motivation um, to, to, uh, 
to support other trade-offs that the scalability dilemma do not catch. Um, specifically, we see that there are certain um, examples that scale up and achieve higher scalability by just being more focused. Now, let's take a look at the chip design, right? So we have CPU that can do everything, that can allow you to do certain, you know, any competition that you want. And then there's GPU, which is, you know, which offer higher performance, but it focuses more on, you know, graphic rendering or like parallel comp computation. And then we have ASIC that can only support one or two certain applications, but offers the best performance. So what is the trade-off that, you know, scalability trilemma is missing. So we are proposing the scalability quadrilemma um, that basically offers a new way to, uh, you know, break free from the scal scalability trilemma. Um, so here we consider one more trade-off um, about generosity of the blockchain. So basically you can um, make some certain trade-off about what are the other applications that your blockchain can support in order to scale up. Um, so the idea is that if we can make some assumption on the execution of the application in your blockchain, then you can tailor some specific solution that leverage this assumption and scale up accordingly. Um, and this is much better than you know, building, building a general purpose scaling solution that is trying to do everything. Now, um, this is the proposal, uh, pro proposal that is in inspired by uh, the scalability quadrilemma. Uh, we are proposing GOMOS or the application spec uh, specific sharding architecture. So the idea of GOMOS is that we realize that many applications can benefit great, uh, greatly from sharding. So these applications are uh, you know, the ones that have multiple components. The one uh, and each of the components do, does not talk to each other so frequent. So now you can easily create a sharding strategy uh, to put each of the components in a separate shard. And you can realize that the number of cross-shard communication is much less compared to the number of like inter-shard communication, sorry, in, intra-shard co communication. Um, and hence, you, you uh, can still enjoy the scalability that sharding offers. And this um, architecture or this uh, approach can be used for both layer one and layer two solutions. Now, this is the basic, uh, you know, high-level architecture of GOMOS. Uh, you can have uh, different shard different local shard and each, each of them maintains uh, one you know, component of the system. And you have the main shard that talks to every other shard to facilitate the cross-shard communication, which is less, much less compared to all the intra-shard communications happen in, in the local shard. And there are several applications that can benefit and can use this design to scale up. Um, we propose a couple of examples. The first one is the sharded decentralized chains. So the idea here is that you can have multiple shards and each of them process only one or two different trading pairs. Um, so for shard one, you can uh, you know, process uh, only the, tr uh, the, the trade between Ether and KNC, or uh, in the shard two, you, can only, uh, you, you, you process only trade between Ether and OMG. And, and then we have the main shard that maintains the base currency like Ether, DAI, or even Bitcoin. Now, with this, you can see that um, most of the trading activities uh, happens within the pair, right? And if you have like, to move your base currency like Ether to a different shard, then you, you only need to send one, one or two transactions to the main shard. Uh, another example that uh, can use GOMOS is a sharded decentralized sharing economy, something like Origin Protocol or a few others are trying to build like, you know, decentralized Uber or decentralized Airbnb, right? Uh, so the idea here is we can create several shards and each of them um, maintains, um, you know, the state of uh, one specific location. It can be a country, it can be a big region, right? Um, so here we have shard one taking care of Singapore business and shard two taking care of Malaysia and shard three taking care of like all the West Coast 
uh, of all the U.S. West Coast. Um, so to conclude, um, I hope that I have convinced uh, everyone that scaling general purpose blockchain might not be feasible. And uh, developers or researchers should start looking for solutions that work better for their purposes instead of trying to generalize everything. Um, we also propose uh, GOMOS, which is an initiative that we have been uh, you know, spending a lot of time doing research at Kyber. Uh, if, you, um, if you are interested, please, please feel free to reach out to us. Uh, we are happy to uh, collaborate. Thank you.